skills, I guess. Um, and I've landed now at Barwon Child Youth and Family and under my little portfolio, I'm the manager of mental health and drug and alcohol services here. And I have the Wayback Support Service, which is a three month psychosocial intervention support service for someone who may have attempted suicide or has really high levels of suicidal ideation. And it's for those people that might find themselves in a situational crisis, um, not those with enduring chronic mental health conditions. And it's, it's about really sort of providing people community connection and linkages and support at that point. I've also got a fabulous little torture and trauma counselling team that works specifically with refugees and asylum seekers. Um, and they're an amazing, passionate bunch of people. And as you're aware, we've got lots of different communities that have settled in the Geelong region. So they're a pretty busy service. And then I won't go into detail, but we have a whole suite of child, youth and family drug and alcohol services that work with people wherever they're at in their substance using kind of journey, I guess. So, and we are in the same building with Odyssey Barwon. So I'll hand the talking stick to Jackson to have a chat, but happy to answer any questions about my history or whatever as we go through the four sessions we've got together. Thanks, Josie. Yeah. Um, so I'm Jackson. I'm currently the catchment manager for all of Odyssey House Victoria's AOD treatment services in the Barwon region. And we focus primarily on adult services. So from 16 to 340. Um, we have a myriad of different services in the Barwon region from day programs to counselling, to case coordination, to overdose prevention, to working with families on family reunification orders um, and kind of everything in between. Um, so my background has been as a clinician, predominantly as a counsellor, which is where I studied um, and then have had a myriad of roles in the AOD space. Uh, spent a lot of time in residential rehab which is a very strong passion of mine. Um, and yeah, now I'm, now I'm here in a non-residential capacity, uh, working with clients, really meeting them where they're at, which you know, Josie touched on already, but you know, our services are all designed to remove barriers for access, remove barriers for engagement. So while we have some services where, where a person will come to us, we equally have services where we will go to them. Uh, and that's a really important part of what we do. Um, so yeah, as Josie said, happy to answer questions about kind of who I am and who we are and what we do and how we got here. But it's it's really great to be here and we're really excited to have the opportunity to be a part of what's hopefully a really good learning process with some nice robust discussion. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Jackson, and, and I think guaranteed that you will give me a robust discussion okay. today. Looking forward to it. How do you do volume? Um, if you have such a mic on, I wear a hearing aid, and that comes at me about 400 times louder than it comes to you. So if you could turn your mic off, Andrea, you're off. All right. It's all right. I just have to sort. Sorted. Sorry, I, just, I get feedback through hearing aids when that happens. Not much gets done. Um, so before I begin from this point, I suppose we've got 52 participants here. There's 35 people have written down where they're from. So if you're late on, can you please write down, apart from Jackson and Josie, where you're, which uh, RTO you're from and what stream you're studying, please, just so we can get those details and Cass is going to cut and paste. So we've got that for the trainers. Um, probably need to introduce myself as this random person who's sitting up in Queensland who's jumped on your screen. Um, my name's Lee. I've worked in the sector for probably as long as Josie has um, across a really broad range of areas. My core business is 100% youth. I'm not an expert in AOD, health or housing, but I'm really privileged to probably be the one person in the sector whose core business is just youth. I don't have to, you know, I don't silo. So my job is to, I suppose my special, specialty area is, is to try and be that specialty that joins people together. For the P 
person who can't hear anything, you might have to turn your mic on. <laughs> I'm not even going to try and work out whose dog's not on silent. Um, so I suppose that that's what I do. So I come at it from a slightly different angle. The Bow and Adolescent Task Force was set up oh, a long time in, in the late 70s. Um, over instant coffee, I do believe, back in the day, to look at how the youth sector could work together and share their toys. So much has shifted since we probably just started in this sector way back then and it, it, because of funding models, the way things are set up, and it's not always been in, in our agencies' controls. So that force has had to bend and flex, as have the workforce, which is a, is a special kind of fatigue in itself. So... We want you guys to have a listen to people who are in the industry right now who've got really solid experience talk about some issues because one of the things we see is we get, we get the media's take on something which may not always. Uh, Gary, if you can't hear it, you, I, I'd say it's your mic, mate, because I think everybody else is hearing it okay. Are you? Yep. All right. Um so that's my background. I've got, an ed I've got an education psych background by trade and have worked in schools, agencies and privately. I present, I've got the my probably favourite part of my job is I spend a lot of time working with presenting to school students and their families because for me the core thing is if we can get families in schools and young people all using the same language and on the same boat, then I think we've got an opportunity for change. My, my job is to put Jackson and Josie out of a job. That's what I'd like to see. Don't think it's going to happen just yet. All right, so we're going to head off. So what, what is this? So March last year, a group of agencies got together when, bizarrely enough, it was the week we went into lockdown. So I'm sorry if that's what caused this. It's not my fault. Um, a few conspiracy theorists out there, this is not what, how this came about. A group of us got together and said, how can we best support the sector when the sector are actually pulled apart? What can we do? So we did some co-design with a few of the agencies and we set up a neutral space and it was really, really simple. The rules were simple. No egos, no logos, no minutes, just actions. And we wanted to hear how people were travelling through this, what work experiences they could do differently. And if you want to find out any more information about that community of online engagement, then let me know and we can send you all the background on that. So that was set up between Batforce and Give Where You Live and it's owned by the sector. Um, hands up if anyone, is there any students here who have attended co-chat sessions? I know we have had quite a few attend. Um, you're welcome as students to attend those sessions whenever they are. Speak to your trainers and they can give you the details if they fit in. One of the things we wanted to do is bridge that gap between who was working in the sector and the pre-service area and bring them into the same space. So we opened that up to all the pre-service. Out of that, we had numerous conversations about the difficulty in you guys getting up to date really good quality placements. So we thought we'll bring some of the placement to you. This won't ever replace your placements, but it gives you the opportunity to pick the brains of some people who've got incredible expertise. And I think I, I always preface something by saying, if my children had an AOD issue, Josie would be the first person I would call. These are the people who are at that point like, who really understand how this all works. So, AOD is our topic. And Jackson and Josie, I'm going to throw to you guys. Um, when we talk about AOD, and I know, Josie, you and I have had this discussion once or twice in 25 years, what's what's your definition of what AOD covers? What is it? Oh, it's an interesting question, mm. I think, to ponder because I'm I'm very clear that I don't think we should separate alcohol from drugs because alcohol is a drug. I think when I think of alcohol and other drugs, it's anything that can have an impact on your nervous system and an impact on your brain and basically can be used in a way to, now I'm not going to get my words right, but most of the substances that people have problems with initially was sort of embedded in the medical world. Mm -hmm. And when people started to use these substances recreationally, that's when they kind of started to get a little bit demonised along the way. So, so I feel like 
you know, we need to look at drugs as a much broader definition and we shouldn't separate the legal versus illegal sort of drugs because mm -hmm. that plays into the stigma that's attached to people seeking help. So, you know, when I think about current trends at the moment, like vaping, um, do we fit that within the alcohol and other drugs category? Mm -hmm. Technically not when it comes to treatment, probably, mm -hmm. but we have to look at the whole picture and what people are taking. Caffeine is a stimulant that can, and we're sitting here all probably drinking coffee and have had our third or fourth for the day, some of us. Um, you know, that is a substance that people can actually use in a way that can be harmful to them. Energy drinks, we all know <laughs> they've got amazing things in them that can have a really negative effect on people. So, so we need to be really flexible with our definition of alcohol and other drugs. And I'd be one of the advocates to, to just use drugs, drug services or, yep. you know, so it is actually reflective and it doesn't create that split in, well, I'm only smoking and using alcohol, so I'm okay. You're using meth. So, oh my God, that's really bad. So it's, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Oh, and okay. I, we've, we've grown up with good drugs and bad drugs. It's the way we've grown yeah. up. But if we look at the, the makeup of alcohol, it's probably when we look at the impact on the brain, one of the one of the dirtiest drugs we can use. Yeah, yeah. it can well, be the most, most marketing example. Thing. That's it. But I'll let Jackson talk to yeah, that. Jackson. Yeah, Jackson. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Statistically, you know, when we analyse data that we capture, alcohol always wins. Mm. And, I, and I don't see that ever changing, really because of its accessibility and its price. Um, so I, I'm very much the same as Josie. And, you know, when we are in discussion, I'll just use the term drugs, but that encompasses everything. Mm. Um, so, yeah, part of that stigma is, you know, what is and isn't socially acceptable. And, and we agree kind of as a society that alcohol is acceptable, yet ironically it's, it causes more harm to our community and, and to individuals um, broadly speaking, than any other substance of misuse. Um, so I think you know, our view as a treatment provider in terms of what constitutes the need for AOD treatment, right? And we're governed by a myriad of things that you know, contain what we can and can't do. And a big part of that is our funding arrangements and what's in scope of our service provision. Um, so for us, and Josie very briefly touched on this, you know, nicotine, for example, that's a whole nother funded service stream, right? There are agencies who just do, or their primary focus is nicotine. Um, that doesn't fall in, in our direct scope. However, it forms part of the story. Um, so for us, it's about the, the definition of, I guess, what makes a person need our services is if they're using any substance, right, in isolation or... In, in a cocktail of other substances where it's having a negative impact on an aspect or multiple aspects of their life. Mm -hmm. So we very much view it as we're a piece of a puzzle and, you know, drug use is either the cause of problems or it's the perpetuating factor of problems or it's the result of other problems that a person's facing. Nonetheless, substance misuse will compound other negative factors in a person's life. So for us, while we're AOD treatment providers, that's our core business, that's not our primary, only sole focus. We must look at the narrative story of a person's life and view substance misuse as a part of that, mm. right? but not as a sole issue. Yeah. It has to be looked at broadly. Absolutely. Yeah, Jackson, I, I want to pick up one of the points you just made is about mm. use a cocktail of drugs. We we often hear the term, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go through a few terms because I think for us we say them all the time, but remembering for pre-service, we're probably for some people are hearing this or not really for the first so I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. We yep. often hear the term polyuse or yep. cocktail of drugs. Yeah. What I, and I, I know you may not have the percentages in front of you, but when we look at the service sector, polyuse of drugs, and we know that often coroners will pull out methamphetamine or one drug as a cause. Yeah. Your take on probably in the last 10 years, are we seeing an increase in polyuse? And do you, do you want to talk a little bit about what that means? Yeah, polydrug use is more common than it's not. Mm. And and essentially the, the definition of polydrug use is 
misusing more than one substance simultaneously. That could be two, three, four, five, ten substances at a time. Um, where you often see you know, an overdose for a person, um, it's very rare that someone will overdose with one substance in their system. Um, particularly when we look at things like methamphetamine or ice. Um, if, if a person has overdosed on ice, I would almost guarantee there's another substance in their system. Um, so one of the most common reasons for poly drug use, and I could talk to you for this about this for the next three days, yeah. but one of the most common reasons a person will use multiple substances is to combat the effects of the other substance, what we would deem as uppers and downers or stimulants and depressants. So we see a lot with ice use, concurrent cannabis use, right, or benzodiazepines, Valium, things like that. So a person will you know, use ice, which kind of has you peaking at a very high level, very stimulated, both in your, kind of your nervous system, but as well as kind of your thoughts and your processing. So then to combat that and get relief and rest and sleep, they'll smoke cannabis or use Valium and things like that. So it tends to, the, the challenge with poly drug use is you're throwing your body into this crazy cycle of up and down, up and down, up and down. And you end up with two substances that are essentially competing, which in essence is what often causes the overdose. Yeah. 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 And I think that's a really important point to make because very rarely does the media talk about that part of it. We put at the drug that's the demon at the time. Right. Yeah. And that combination and, and you know, Josie and, and Malcolm will, will know that I've pushed for, I, I actually say alcohol, energy drinks and other drugs because yeah. I've yet to meet a nice person using methamphetamine who didn't start on four or five containers of energy drinks a day. Yeah. That, that stimulus impact of using, especially for young people, that stim, using a stimulant with a central nervous system depressant has its own dangers involved with it. Right. So starting to really understand that there's often more than one drug on board and that we, if we pull one drug out, we're not seeing, as you mentioned earlier, Jackson, which is treating the whole. So, yeah, yeah. And when yeah. we look at that kind of 10 year piece you mentioned, I, I think the other big factor in poly drug use is accessibility. So, so you know, we talk about this ice pandemic, right? There's no major statistical indications that more people are using drugs, no. right? It's the fact that people shift between substances based on their accessibility. Mm. So, you know, more people now use ice than what we're using heroin 15 years ago. So there's a shift in the substance of choice, more so than the amount of people using substances. When you look at natural growth kind of capita within the, within the country or within the state. Um, so that's a really key point is when a person's at the point of a misusing substances, and if you can't get, let's say your drug of choice was heroin, and that often dries up for periods of time. If you can't get that, what's the next best thing? It's whatever my dealer can give me at the time. So that's a big part. And we certainly saw that. I mean, you know, Josie and Malcolm and I are old enough to remember when we used to have the heroin toll on the news on the top of the newspaper when we were we were younger. Yeah. And they put all of these different interventions in and, and heroin really dried up and it had nothing to do with the interventions. Mm. It was purely that there was drought where heroin opioid was being grown. Yeah. That was that was what changed it. And people shifted drugs quite readily in that environment. Very okay, true. so we've got a bit of an idea of the definition of drugs. Um, as you go into agencies, everybody will have their own way that they speak about that. But I, I suppose for me, it's something to consider as you step into agencies is when you are screening for what or speaking with young people, especially if you're working in a generalist, how are you talking? What drugs are you talking about? Because they may, what's normal for them may not be considered a drug. So really starting to think about how big that list is and, and making sure you're up to date with, with what's around at the time. You know, even in the vape space, if you use the word vape, e-cigarettes, there's just a constant change in language in that space. Um, yeah, and you go overseas and it's completely different again. So, you know, recently back in New Zealand and everyone's talking about P, um, which is what they call ice over there. So, you know, getting used to the fact that depending on where, or if you're working with people from Pacifico nations, things like that, that the language might shift again. 
So a couple of other terms, and I, I will drill down the methamphetamine, Malcolm, don't pan on it. Malcolm gets nervous when I start talking because he's written an agenda and he knows I haven't even looked at it. I don't know why he wrote it. It was so cute that he wrote it. Um, he just Sometimes he just thinks I'm going to have a crack. There's a couple of terms when I read through these these newspaper articles and, and I cringed and yelled and screamed and debriefed with Josie when I read them, but I was really privileged two years ago that the Geelong Advertiser moved in next door to my work, which everyone thought was quite entertaining if you'd seen 25 years of me fighting with the Geelong Advertiser. And they've now got such a great view. If you think of where the Geelong Addy sits now in Geelong, they've got a fantastic view of what's going on in the city centre, but they very rarely pick the good bits because... You know, it, it doesn't sell papers. A couple of the terms that Malcolm's put in the documents and you might see around are terms like reform, recommissioning, service commissioning. Josie, when we talk about recommissioning, are you able to, what, what do we mean when we talk about that within the context of our service sector? Do you want to just talk a little bit to that? Yeah, yeah. So recommissioning, I guess, means when the bucket of money gets all thrown back into the big bucket and there's a competitive tendering process to actually commission those dollars in a different way. So the AOD setting, and that's a really simplistic way of kind of defining it. Jackson might have a bit more of an articulate way of <laughs> defining that. But in 2014, we in the AOD setting went through a, a massive recommissioning process, which meant lots and lots of changes. Um, and behind that was, I guess, some principles about wanting to get to a point where services were actually working with the right people that needed treatment. So there wasn't this big kind of um, bottleneck of people on wait lists that really, really needed treatment. Often what happens in operations is very, very different. So in my opinion, and this is just Josie's opinion, I think the recommissioning space has made access a bit more difficult for people within the drug and alcohol space. But what it did do, client choice was the other thing yep. that was part of that recommissioning. So before 2014, we didn't have an Odyssey bar when that was accessible in the region. It, we could access their statewide services. We could refer to detoxes and rehabs, mm -hmm. but we didn't have anyone but Barwon Health that was doing that adult treatment kind of piece. So what the reform or what the recommissioning did was actually allow another consortium to come into the region to actually be able to offer a much more diverse suite of mm -hmm. services and choice because if someone's now had a bad experience with either service they can go back and forth a bit and choose where they want to actually get the right support and treatment for themselves so i've extended for that a little bit lee but recommissioning pretty much means what are we doing with the service sector let's look at the reform documents and what's behind those reform documents and try and make the services better um yeah so i don't know whether you want to add to that Jackson, um, but that's probably, and, and I have a lot of opinions around recommissioning because I also think it's a bit of an issue when you look at that competitive tendering space because mm. it does pitch services against each other at times. Mm. So, so we all wanna work in partnership and we all wanna work for the best outcomes for clients, but mm. often those processes can make things really complicated at a political service level. Um, and often the recommissioning is pushed through, I guess, political agendas and um, government interests rather than a real look at what's evidence-based and what's good for the community. And again, that's just Josie's view, but um, mm. I think it's one that probably Lee and Malcolm would share in mm. that setting and probably mm. Jackson. <laughs> mm. I yeah. think in the, the recommissioning Josie referenced in 2014 for the AOD sector in Victoria, I think what it did really well was it diversified the sector mm -hmm. in regions. So yeah. where you had, you know, essentially, if we look at the state broken up into regions, each region was dominated by one organisation. And, you know, that's theoretically fine, but, you know, organisations are complex things and they're, you know, they're hard to manage at times, things happen. Um, so what it did was it just shared the resources more broadly within each region across the state 
and it meant client choice, as Josie touched on, but it also meant kind of theoretically more stability within the government's allocation of money to ensure continued service delivery. So, you know, at times, organisations don't necessarily um, you know, continue as they may have liked to and, and all the politics internally for organisations. So it meant that there was a bit of risk of kind of aversion for the state government where they said, well, if we've got multiple organisations operating in a space, if one organisation, for whatever reason, decides not to deliver that service anymore, we've got other options there that are already embedded and delivering service. So there was a bit of a, a risk analysis perspective from the, from the government, just to ensure that at no point does a person go without the ability to access treatment. Yeah, and Jackson, I think you, you've got a really good point there. As a, the independent peak, Batforce will often get phone calls from families where the young person's gone in a certain door, that hasn't worked for them, or yeah. it's been a negative, and we've been able to advocate to go somewhere else. When we've only got one door, that becomes a real issue. Oh. And we've got you think, can I say something? Mm. You think it needs, like, to be looked at, I don't know, like the percentage of people that, um, benefit from rehab or stuff like that. It's like tiny. It's three percent or something like that. Um, yeah, it's not very successful in that term. Do you know That's, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would question where you're getting those statistics from. Um, there's no. The reason I say that is there's no broad governing peak body that holds that statistical information. So each organisation captures that, reports it to the department for themselves. And, yeah. And that's, so there's kind of wherever you've, and this is part of, I think, what we're here to discuss, which is a great segue, where if you've read it in the media, take it with a grain of salt, um, in the sense that rehabilitation services across Victoria in particular, it's incredibly hard to measure success of recovery for a person. This is generally because my recovery is different to Josie's recovery and what we believe to be our kind of journey of recovery is so vastly individualized mm -hmm. as it should be. So those broad, broad kind of sweeping statistical statements that we see, particularly in the articles that we, we're either kind of look at, are just unable to be embedded in truth because that information doesn't exist. And for the most part, nor can it, can it exist because the whole point is that it's an individual treatment process. Um, so- yeah, I heard it from- um like a bloke that runs a rehab. So that could basically just be on, on what they've learned through their service, yeah? Correct. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Gary, yeah. Good, good conclusion there, mate. Mm. Roma, you've got a question. You probably have to come okay. up here. Yes. Sorry, so I just had a question sort of so pertaining to what you guys were just talking about with the recommission. So how safer do you think the recommission made it for people accessing services in terms of transparency, um, if that sort of makes sense. So if there's only one service, are they more likely, I guess, to be able to mistreat people that come to the service and get away with it in regards to there now being more services? And what do you think about that? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting mm. question, I think, um, because safety, in a service, we all try and create safety for a person as soon as they walk in the door in, in many, many different mm. ways. So we want to create a great, you know, we all work from a trauma-informed lens. So we do want people to come in and have a great experience. There's, there's always feedback and kind of complaint processes in services. And, and I hope as a manager that people who are coming to the service as consumers get told their rights and responsibilities and are really encouraged to have a voice because consumer voice for us is super important in shaping our services. I guess, you know, in a really black and white kind of way, Roma, if someone's had a really bad experience, there is now choice to go to somewhere else. So that's a great thing for the, the person that's trying to seek the right treatment and support for them. Not sure if I answered your question in its entirety, but... I guess I really, really think that term safety and we all aim as services to do no further harm. So if someone's rocking in our door, that's our biggest thing. We do not want to do any further harm and safety is the biggest thing that we focus on. And you've all probably learnt about 
the harm minimization philosophy by now and the harm reduction space. So we're all about harm reduction and working with the individual about what's going to keep them yeah. safe. So as managers, we hope our clinicians are actually working in that way and are working in a, in a trauma-informed way to create safety for everyone, but also really open to the fact that we're not going to be the right service for everybody. So we need to be really aware of that and okay with that. Um, yeah. I think that's a really interesting point, Josie, and, and I take it back when I speak to families when they first enter the service sector that we've all been the mechanics that we don't like what they've done and we've all been the hairdressers we don't like and we seem to be completely okay with shopping around and looking for things like that. Yeah. But different people have different ways of, of, of recovery and Jackson talked about how individualised recovery is. So it may not be what's on offer fits the way you recover and that's completely okay. So yeah. letting people know that there's always another option preferably. Jackson, I, I want to tap into, because of your background too, do you want to explain a little bit the difference between detox and rehab? Yeah, yeah good question. Mm. Um, so I'll start with detox. It's probably a bit simpler. Um, detox is essentially, oh, it's a bit of an old school term, but like a, a drying out process or a withdrawal process. Um, so a person would go to a detox facility more often than not to very much get a, a substance out of their system. Right? So it's really a processing kind of experience where um, if you were to go to a residential detox unit, you would go there, you would be supported to withdraw from substances. So there's a lot of risks when your body has become dependent on an external substance or a drug. Um, and there's risks associated with different drugs and it, it's a relatively complicated medical process. So you would go to a withdrawal unit so that you can cease substance use safely and be monitored and make sure that there's no adverse side effects. Um, they're traditionally or usually between seven and 21 days for a withdrawal process. And you can also be supported to go through a withdrawal process at home. And we have here some non-residential withdrawal nurses that monitor and support and assist with medication uh, people who are wanting to kind of cease their substance use for that period of time and withdraw from substance use, but don't have the option to you know, take seven to 21 days out of their life mm -hmm. and go to a, a dedicated facility. Um, it's Normally, it would be medically supervised by nurses and GPs, and it is very much more than anything a health process. So you'd put it under the banner of health when we're talking about detox. Rehabs, on the other, on the other hand, uh, are a much bigger kind of beast within themselves. And there's no kind of strict definition for what a rehabilitation or residential rehabilitation service is. Um, they, they vary, they're all different, and they need to be. Because as we spoke about earlier, it's, it's consumer option, it's consumer choice. So in Victoria, you have uh, two main categories of rehabs. You have publicly funded rehabs, which is kind of what we do. We're publicly funded. Um, and then you have private funded rehabs, which are kind of not government funded. Right? Mm. Um, a rehab is more than a health kind of process or a medical process. A resi rehab kind of experience for a person is very much, no matter where you go, a holistic experience. So it's about learning. It's about developing skills. It's about, you know, reintegrating into a community that isn't as harmful as the one you may be in. It's about, you know, linkages, support. So what you often find is rehab for people is kind of when life's gotten to its kind of worst point, right? And it's where... You know, engaging with a counsellor or a case manager in the community right, is just not quite enough because life's a bit too messy, it's a bit too complicated, there's too much going on. So for people that, that go to a residential rehab facility, it's one, an incredible effort on their behalf and shows a phenomenal kind of positive character for them to take that step because it, it is a terrifying step. Mm -hmm. right? um, but it is also like a really intensive kickstart 
into the direction that you want life to go. So more often than not, rehabs would include case management, that include counselling, that include a lot of group work and community-based kind of interaction and, and learning development. Um, and then post kind of program support and a, and a reintegration back into you know, what we would deem as normal life, so to speak, right? Um, but into the life that a person is really aiming for. So there's a myriad of different types of rehabs ranging from kind of six weeks in length up to kind of two years in length, depending on what a person needs. There's different models, there's therapeutic communities, there's community integration models, there's you know, all different types of rehabs as there should be because you know, we don't all go into an ice cream shop to get the same flavor, right? We want what we need and what we want. So in essence, a rehab facility is community driven, it's learning, it's psychoeducational, it's really about holistic self-development. A detox is a health process more than anything else. Jackson, because um, I've been told you're not going to be shy with me on this one, we often hear that there's, there's, there's... Is there a difference between private and agency set up detox yep. or, or um, rehab facilities? Yep, there's one key difference and... You know, there's a place for everything in life, right? As there is, ironically, at times, a place for drug use, right? I'm not mm -hmm. condoning it, but there's a place for it, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same with private versus public funded programs. The biggest issue, in my very humble, small opinion, is regulation around these things, yeah. right? So if I was to open a private mental health institution, I would be regulated, and there would be a governing body and frameworks that I would have to adhere to because it falls more under the umbrella of, of the health kind of setting, right? That's why private hospitals work really well because they still have to adhere to the same governance as a public hospital. The, re, uh, the AOD space is probably the most unregulated space and ungoverned space of all community services in the sense that there just isn't a broad governance body for private and public. So the challenge is that with a, a public rehab, we have to adhere to accreditation. We have to meet very strict standards around how we operate, what we do, when we do it, who we do it with, and all those types of things. And if we don't adhere to them, we get shut down. Yeah. A private rehab, put simply, is I could open up my house tomorrow and invite people in, and now I have a rehab. And that's it. There's no registration process. There's no governance process. There's no quality process. There's no risk management process that has to be adhered to. So while there are some public, there are some private rehabs that work really effectively, there's also some that are just complete rogue cowboys because they can do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So I know of one in particular that in order to access this rehab, right, you have to sign over your power of attorney to the bloke that runs it. Right? My issue with that fundamentally is you're preying on vulnerable people. So if Josie came to me and she had a loved one who was in the, the absolute rife of addiction and I said, I can fix this person for 50 grand, she's going to find the 50 grand because I've guaranteed her something that's unguaranteeable. Yeah. Right? With no where for Josie to go once I take that money and the treatment doesn't work, right? there's no appeals process, there's no governance body to go to. So the biggest issue is risk. And that's why, you know, personally, my preference will always be publicly funded programs until such time as there is a regulation or a regulating body that governs the whole thing. Practice, yeah. Yeah. And that actually brings us back to what Roma and Gary said when Gary sort of said, you know, 3%, the data we're getting when we've got two different systems, it's very difficult for us to get lined up data. And Roma's question around transparency is we don't know what's happening behind those doors in private facilities. No idea. So, and yeah. if, if the newspaper's reporting on what they're hearing there, that's not necessarily. And I suppose last year was a really good opportunity to reflect on a private versus government. If we look at the number of peak deaths we had in nursing homes, private versus public last year, mm. it was ridiculously different, like hundreds and hundreds. It was less than 10 
in government settings and over what 700 in in private yeah. settings so regulation all of that that we've had we've had an example right in front of us in the last 12 months yeah. so yeah i think that that really speaks to the questions that gary and roma asked before too um Malcolm, i think i was just going to say reg regulation around practice is key too so i guess we're not ever going to discourage somebody from choosing a private oh, rehab, but we would exercise caution because we're not sure what sort of practice is happening within those settings. So we are tied to clinical guidelines. We have absolute connection to evidence-based practice. Um, the other thing I was going to mention was there's often huge wait lists for our service. So the tension of going, I'm ready for treatment now, a private setting, the door can open with money straight away. So it's often the more attractive option. But I guess we just sit with caution in that space. And mm. as Jackson's mentioned, the vulnerability of people that are coming to the doorstep in the desperation often drives that decision-making rather than sort of solid sitting down, let's think about the next step. So I feel like our role is often to slow things down a bit <laughs> when things are feeling really crazy and actually really offer you know, some really good service options and work with the person to see when they're ready to do it. Um, yeah, I think that's a big thing because, yeah, the, you know, people are ready and they're ready to go. Yeah. And then they can't get in there. Like and, it's yeah. just... That part of that, Gary, is navigating the system. Mm. So, you know, if someone came to me today, I could get them into rehab within a week, into a publicly funded rehab. The challenge, and it's builds out of the recommissioning piece that Josie spoke about is you just got to know who to call and there's a million numbers. Mm. So the the bigger challenge is not wait lists. Yep. Rehabs, ironically, publicly funded rehabs never really have a wait list. It's about getting the process done. The quicker you can do the process, the quicker you're in. Mm. Right? Because there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of kind of medical stuff that needs to happen prior to an admission to a rehab. So having worked and kind of managed a lot of rehabs, the biggest holder to someone coming into a public rehab is them getting their piece of the puzzle done with their community case manager. Mm. Um, so normally you could get into a, a rehab within 14 days max, I reckon, yep. if you know the avenues to get to. Process. And that's an awareness piece. That's a, you know, a piece of work that does need across the sector to be worked on more is how, where do I go? access things yeah i think that's uh, the major problem for people a lot of people haven't got a clue where to go yeah yeah i've got a question andrew but andrew bradley you've got your hand up i'm trying to find you on my screen off mute andrew andrew i think you're on mute andrew yeah you still yeah there we go is that better that's better. Yeah. Look, I might be jumping forward here. It might be on the agenda, but I was had a question about the ice replacement therapy. Um, heard a lot of stuff, but um, I wonder if you can handle some of the, the myths about it. Does it exist, for instance? And Andrew, that's a really important one. Can we park that for a second to we come well, down to that? Are you happy with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it might be down to yeah. that. Oh, right. <laughs> good good jumping ahead, though. Really good question. And we'll get, we will we'll get, get Andrew, Andrew to write the agenda for next week because he's all over it. <laughs> I'll definitely park it and we'll get there when we get to that point, Andrew, if that's okay. So start thinking about your questions as you go. One of the things I want you to think about as, as you're listening to the speakers today is coming from a place of critical literacy. You're about to read or you've read or you're going to pretend you've read and you're going to read it when you finish this, which is kind of how I roll. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah you, the articles in the Addy is start to think with a critical lens of is the data that's being presented, where's it from, who's being asked the question, because Jackson and Josie are already starting to unpack the difference in the different spaces. Malcolm, I'm going to throw to you for a second to, to talk about the mention of illicit or legal nature um, and what our confidentiality is for this crowd. Yeah, look, one of the things that we see as a barrier, and when we're talking about safety, we often include the component that young people are often reluctant to seek support until they're age 18 because of the legal nature um, or illegal nature of illicit substances and, and are worried about confidentiality requirements of us to inform 
their guardians around their disclosures of substance use. And particularly in the youth space, this is really important. So Josie and Jackson, I'm throwing back to you. If I'm a 12 year old accessing your services and I disclose illicit substance use, are you going to tell my parents? Oh, that's a very good question, Malcolm, because I think it depends on a lot of factors. But ultimately, 16 years and up, we see a young person as being able to kind of engage and there's, there's a confidential nature to their engagement. Under 16, it's a real, like a 12-year-old, there's a parent in there. We're obliged to actually talk to that parent about the risk that the 12-year-old is placing themselves under. But in school settings, like I'll just put this forward as a bit of a scenario, and often if something's picked up as an issue, we would bring the young person in, have a conversation with them about how important it is to actually engage their parent in this because of the nature of what they're doing. Um, and we would try and engage them in that and, and get them to understand the context of why they need parent involved in the in the next steps so it's about keeping them safe it's about having a limit set up in their lives and there's a great YSAS theory I'm not sure where it is embedded but Andrew Broon talks about the limit setting kind mm. of principles and I think Lee alluded to it it's so important that we as people who are working with young people engage parents because we're in people's lives for an hour a week, hour a fortnight sometimes when we're, we're in a counselling sort of space. Parents or natural support systems around them are such a big part of that community in keeping people safe. So we need to bring them in and we need to work with them. What if the fact you're informing their parents though and that's putting them in danger, you know what I mean? And their that's, parents. I think, yeah. Gary, that's a good point. When I say... It's an interesting decision to make because if the family is part of the problem, we, we will not actually make a young person more unsafe by sharing that information with their parents. We'll make, a, we'll make a judgment on that and we're making a judgment based on the information that's being presented to us. But, but we have a duty of care to keep children safe and we work with mandatory reporting. So if there's risk involved, we might be getting people like Child's First involved, we might be getting child protection involved, we might be thinking about what other family services we need to actually bring in to work yeah. with the whole picture. So absolutely respect where you're coming from. That's why when Malcolm asked it, I went, hmm, that's an interesting one because there's so many parts of someone's narrative and story that you have to pay attention to. We yeah. don't want to distract, we don't want to detract that 12 year old for seeking treatment because we want to be able to offer a safety response, but we also need to be really aware of the risk and safety and our, our policies and procedures and our legal requirements that we sit within. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So does yeah. that respond? Hard one. It is a really hard one. I can hear Jack going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly within the context of schools, as somebody who's worked in wellbeing in schools, that risk of harm to self or harm to others has to come into play. Yes. But as and if family's part of that, it's about bringing in. And I think one of my frustrations with our service system, which is probably why I like the, the Myra Justice system over in New Zealand, is we talk about the support being the family. It's about the young person being able to choose who the people are around them that are that far now, that are that support in their community too. Yeah. And it's, it's a shift we have to make. Jackson, sorry, I jumped in on you. Yeah. You're right. I was just going to speak to like the legislative side of it. Um, and we're, yeah. we're a bit luckier because we just work with 16 and above, yeah. which is yeah. far simpler. Um, but, you know, what we deal with a lot is, you know, someone who's misusing drugs but has a dependent child, dependent children. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, even can even be more of a grey area. Um, in saying that, Victoria's really lucky in the sense that we, we have probably the most developed kind of legislative response in, in the country to this sort of stuff. Um, so the two key ones, or one of the key ones there, which was an update to legislation maybe three, four years ago, is the child information sharing scheme. Yeah. And that is really about kind of a, a legitimate kind of proactive response to the safety and well-being of a child. So we would look at that and we would look at you know, just general mandatory reporting guidelines for an adolescent or minor to formulate a decision. 
and there's key people within regions that we can access. So we have access to advisors yeah. and consultants who specialise in that area that, that we just call them mm. and we ask for their guidance around that. So the system itself is really developed and, and built to keep a young person safe, yeah. first and foremost, um, but also to ensure that networks around that child talk to each other. Because we are, we're AOD treatment providers. Mm. So we're not always the key person. Sometimes we may be the person that brings that care team together. But sometimes we're just a part of that care team. Yeah. So the biggest thing is that interagency kind of communication. And, yeah. and if you, you know, you have good communication, mm. you follow legislation, you, you really, it's all there for you to manage that stuff. Yeah. I'm going to drill down into while we're here, because Andrew's, going to keep me on this we're, we're here to talk about um, methamphetamine which I suppose uh, Josie and I went on a bit of a journey a few years ago with our town's ice fight if any of you remember that um, little yeah, Malcolm was on that journey Malcolm, a you were too. Too. It, was a, it was a cult we we're all involved with a few oh. years back I think I got I got kicked off it the first person to be kicked out of a cult um, <laughs> First of all, I want you to talk about methamphetamine and why so many people are on it. Because when I present, I'll give you an example. I presented to 2019 over 4,000 parents across 2019. Josie's seen it. I do a trivia quiz at the start and I get parents to guess what percentage of people have tried methamphetamine. I am yet to have a group, say, less than 20% of the population. Now, less than 20% of the population buried for Collingwood. Most of us know Collingwood supporters. So that's the sense in the community that it is rife. And that comes from a certain place, which is very near the Bat Force office. Um, I want you guys to talk about methamphetamine, what it means in your worlds before we start going on. And I'm, I'm really mindful, I only got half an hour. But what, what, what's methamphetamine? And why is it up the flagpole? You want to take this first or go Jackson and then I'll, I'll have a bit of time to think then. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like put simply, methamphetamine is super addictive because it makes you feel good, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that's not always spoken about enough is that people start using drugs because drugs are, in that moment are good, right? And if you've got an issue that you're facing in life or you've got some trauma or life's just not great, you're looking for an escape. If you use, if you, you know, you introduce a drug, you're going to feel a lot better at that moment. Um, so there's a reason people get addicted to substances because at the, at the start, they, they're good, right? Um, the, the biggest kind of, one of the biggest reasons right, why ice is so addictive is that it, it is, it amplifies particularly dopamine, so if we look at neurotransmitters, it amplifies the release of dopamine into your brain more than any other substance, right? So most comparable to something like cocaine, but even then, it, if you were to get pure methamphetamine, on average, it's about 10 times the release of natural dopamine into your brain. So if you think about that, dopamine is responsible for pleasure, drive and motivation, focus, you know, all these really important things in life. So you introduce that, it's like this super experience where you feel like you're completely motivated and focused and full of pleasure and contentment. Challenge with, with that is that, you know, our brains aren't built to cope with that for starters. Yeah. And, and it depletes your natural resources that are available to you in, inside your brain already. So quite simply, the highs are much higher, but the lows are a lot, lot lower. So then it becomes this process of tolerance. And I'm, I'm sure you know, most of you have probably heard of tolerance where your body adapts and we're really good at adapting to kind of new things and, and things that are being introduced into our systems, which is why you know, we drink more and more coffee as we get older to try and stay awake. Right? It's essentially achieving the same thing, ironically. Um, but what happens is then you become reliant on the drug because you've had to use more and more and more frequently to kind of get that same result and to not feel crappy 
right? So it, it has this kind of neurological response, unlike any other substance. But then it's all the stuff which I think is more important, all the impacts on every other area of your life, right? Because you start prioritizing getting on it, right? So what makes ice so so powerful in that respect is where if we compare it to alcohol, right? More often than not, alcohol and alcohol addiction, right, takes quite a long time to develop. Right? It's a bit more of a slow burn. Heroin as well, right? Traditionally, it's different for everyone, but it might take a good few months, more than a year, to kind of really start to build a habit and a dependence. That an intentional pun there, Jackson. <laughs> good pick up there, Gary. Um, but I seems to accelerate that process a lot quicker because it's a very intense substance. It's a very intense reaction inside of your body where, you know, we, we've seen people who have picked up ice you know, two months ago and now they're using every day right? and they had no kind of notable addiction prior to that. So it just seems to amplify this notion of becoming dependent on a substance quicker than any other drug. And I think that's where some of the challenge comes from because we see people go from really functioning lives, right, to just complete despair in a time frame that we haven't really seen before to that magnitude. It's very true. Yeah. 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 And I'll, just to add mm. to that, I mean, that's, that's a beautiful kind of articulated mm. response to that. Um, but I, I see methamphetamine as it's a drug. We, yeah. we work with every person's experience of a particular drug so as i was listening to jackson talk i've written there is a continuum of use mm -hmm. so not everybody who picks up methamphetamine is going to take that trajectory where straight away i can't put it down and i need it every day we do have people who can use drugs recreationally mm -hmm. and pick it up once and maybe go, okay, I've tried it. I've got no interest in actually continuing with it and, and not go there. But then we have those that find themselves where Jackson's described it, where they are prioritising it in their worlds and it becomes everything to mm. them. Um, I guess the term a functioning drug user, we actually talk about that a lot when mm. we um, are working with people. And it just makes me think about the world of parenting. We, we do have parents who can function as drug users and yeah. parent and keep their kids safe. And we're often having connection points with child protection, statutory services where we're needing to educate. When I say that, I want to qualify it with we're, we've always got our eyes on the safety of the children, but we really, really need to think about not everybody goes straight down there and can't function. I guess that's the point I want to drive home. Mm. Um, supply, Jackson alluded to mm. that. When we had the meth, amphetamine, ice kind of epidemic hit, or we basically seen supply go through the roof of that particular drug. So we had individuals that would usually have speed as their drug of choice, but they were heading off to their dealer and all they could get from their dealer was meth at the time. Mm. So, so that's what they're going to choose because that's their option at that mm. point to use. So, so I think it's important that supply that element because, you know, as soon as meth dries up, we have another substance come in that's, and at the moment cocaine is on the rise. So, and GHB. So mm. they're kind of the supply things that are, are available and people are, are going for that rather than a meth. But mm. I think that's important to get is, is a lot of it is about that supply and what's accessible. And I was amazed by how many people going, I didn't actually want meth. I went for speed and mm. I walked out with this crystally substance that was mm. very strong and didn't suit that person's needs. Mm. Um, so, Josie, yeah, I just wanted to drive that point home a little bit. Yeah, Josie, can I take you back a step? We've, we've yeah. talked about ice now. You know, methamphetamine's been around since cocky was an egg, you know, that's yep. how houses got vacuumed and cleaned in the 50s. Um, you know, it was it was marketed as something that would help housewives get the job done so they'd be ready for their husbands when they got home. Yep. Don't know why that didn't stick. Um, where, where did ice come in? Where, when did methamphetamine all of a sudden decide it was ice? Because that's happened in our 
our work life, our sort of work careers. What happened? I'm going to let you, Jackson's going, mm, mm, so I feel like he wants to respond to that. So I'm going to let him it. jump into that. Yep. Um, it, it really started to be kind of noticeable in the late 90s. If mm. you look at kind of statistical data, this is a really good conversation to also take on with you because it's a really good one to break down some stigma. Mm. Right. The difference between ice and speed is just refinement. Yep. So to make in its full term crystalline methamphetamine, you're, you're essentially taking amphetamine, which is speed, and you're refining it to a point of purity where it pre presents as a crystal. Yeah. Right? That's the only difference. Yeah. So you know, more people who, you know, we, we work with a lot of people who are like, I'd never do meth. And I'll be like, have you ever done MDMA? Have you ever like, done pingers, right? Mm -hmm. And if you've done a pinger, you've done meth because MDMA, the MA is methamphetamine mm -hmm. in MDMA. Right? So it's, there's a lot of stigma attached to this notion of ice, but really it's, it's in essence, it's just an amphetamine that's been purified. And where the point that Josie made where people go, geez, it was really intense mm -hmm. because you need, if you take the same amount of ice that you do of speed, you, you're actually taking more. So if you take two points, right, those two points are very different in terms of their purity. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the major difference. Um, so yeah, it's it's really just a, a refinement process of the same drug, and that supply chain is the big piece. So where I think this is part of why there's a massive increase in the substance is if we look at heroin, which was the kind of kingpin drug, right? You got to grow it, right? It, it comes from the pop, the sap of a poppy plant, right? So you can only you, you can't make more than you can grow, and if there's issues with that growth, such as drought. Right, it becomes a problem. Right, if you've got a bit of know-how in a couple of meds from a chemist, you can make meth in a Coke bottle. Right? Mm. So it, there's no limitations to the quantity that can be manufactured. Right? But you know, the substances to do that have to be usually gained illegally. So that's where you see an increase in crime. And you know, we all know what the bikies are like at times in that space. Um, so I think it's, it's just a trend. And I don't think there's any real cause for it. There's aspects that make it a thing. Yeah. But, you know, we've seen heroin for a long time dominated. There was still ice around when heroin was dominating, yeah. right? And then we've, we, it always fluctuates, mm -hmm. right? For all of these reasons compounded into one. Um, but at the end of the day, this will pass. And, you know, at times we see heroin slightly overtake ice use and, and vice versa. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a very easy target to point a finger at right in terms of blaming a lot of other issues on ice use yeah jackson we have a very large vocal group that are pointing the finger at methamphetamine called the alcohol industry because it's really important for the alcohol industry to say look over there yeah. mm -hmm. um so we know that a lot of the funding you know and a lot of the push has been impact you know has has had an effect from the alcohol industry saying look over there because they're being really naughty but um there's a lot of high functioning alcoholics out there so mm -hmm. there's a whole range of reasons while we're sitting here and i realize we've got about 40 minutes left and i'm i don't want to jump too much because this has been a really valuable conversation so i don't want to cut it off I want to do, Andrew talked about ice replacement. Can we just really quickly, Jackson, talk to what ice replacement is and your opinions on the impact or effect, efficacy of it? It's an interesting one. Um, there's not a specific ice replacement therapy like there is with like an opiate replacement therapy. So if we talk about heroin use, you would, you know, usually use what well, used to be methadone was the, the replacement of choice which is just a controlled dose of heroin. Uh, now it's things like Suboxone, which have Narcan or Naloxone built into it. So um, it's an opiate replacement therapy that you can't then use on top of. So one of the issues with methadone is I'd use my methadone, then inject heroin, and I'm getting an even bigger high for free. Um, so there's a really well-developed field of replacement therapy and treatment therapy medically for heroin. There's no real equivalent for ice. So more often than not, benzodiazepine is used to moderate and somewhat control the reduction and ultimately kind of ceasing of ice use. Um, 
the tazepine is a big one because it's it, it very much calms the mind but also the body as well um, and it just helps to slow things down there's always trials going on for you know the the magic cure to to fix ice use but you know put simply that just doesn't exist so more often than not if i was to withdraw from ice i'd go either go to detox get a non-residential withdrawal nurse and then they would prescribe me a controlled regime of benzodiazepine or cotiapines, the other one, so Seracool is another one. That's Have you got an opinion on why you think that is with in regards to ice? Like, because clearly they could make a substitute. You know what I mean? Well, they could block. I don't know if they can make it. They could for ice like that. So, yeah. what do you think that is that they don't? I would question whether they can, because, yeah. and again, I come back to that individual, because there's been a lot of talk about using things like Ritalin and Dexamphetamine to kind of put in a replacement therapy for ice. Again, I think it's around the end. So we talk about the function of the drug use. Often there's mental health stuff going on. There might be other conditions going on that are untreated. So when you're looking at a person's story, What's going on for them? What might be untreated? If you can reduce your ice use and replace it with something else that might work for your mental health or for your other presentation or problem that's there, that's going to be a bit of a replacement therapy for the individual. But again, I just come back to, I don't think we've got enough evidence or enough knowledge of what could replace it broadly, like a, a heroin, methadone or suboxone, which yeah. we know has great impact for people um for making change we're going so to have to hold there. questions sorry sorry just yeah. for a second we're going to have to hold questions because we've only got 10 minutes left and we've got to get on to the next part of this mm. i just want to point out somebody's put in the the chat about do we educate kids at school around drug use every school does it differently they mm. bring it there's a combination of they do a little bit in class they do other things i'm certainly in a lot of schools talking about how we make choices Drug education doesn't just start with understanding how the drug works. It starts right back with understanding your mental health, understanding your triggers. There's a whole range of, you know, your regulatory systems, things like that. So it's just not a coordinated approach. And Josie and I over the years have stopped and started on a hundred different ways of doing this. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's very difficult to get funding for a prevention model when you you can't measure people being educated about drugs because you can't measure whether they go on to drug use or not. So we'll hold questions for now. I want, I'd want i like um, Jackson and, and I want to ask Jackson and Josie very quickly. And when we finish today, by the end of today on the Batforce website, there will be a landing page called SCOCHAT, which will have a list of questions for you to go away and answer for next week. Now, there's a broad range of questions on that. We haven't completely settled on the questions. We want to see what came out of this before we finalise it. But by the end of the day, and I'll put it in the chat what our website is, Stephen's going to have a, a landing page up for that. And the articles will be dropped on that page too, but you need to give us till the end of today to get that done. Yeah. Jackson and Josie, I want you to have a think about the articles you saw in the paper. Um, I was a little bit disappointed that neither of you took the time to comment in those articles. I yep. saw lawyers and police and all these, and I'm thinking, you know, you're the rock stars in town who know this stuff, and I was really disappointed to see that you guys didn't take the opportunity to, to put your side over in those and, and wonder what stopped your, what was the barrier there? So I did. We were asked for comment. So we had an approach, or I did, through our media and comms person at the agency to comment on what our experience was currently with methamphetamine presentations. It wasn't reflective of our experience. So when we sent off a one-page media comment, um, I spoke to exactly what I'm speaking to today in the sense of our experience being we're seeing slight increases in cocaine use, we're seeing slight increases in GHB, but alcohol and cannabis are still the primary presentations for us that people mm. are seeking help for. And I gave a really lovely kind of blurb on what services are available for people to be able to access. None of that was used. So I guess it gives you a sense there of 
So I, I had to take a very deep breath and I was quite angry at the way things were presented within those articles because that sort of narrative often creates more stigma for the people that are using drugs and they're not going to come and seek help from treatment services like ours because of the stigma that's attached to that particular substance. So, so I, I, you know, I guess we take deep breaths, we get a little bit angry, but then we have to calm ourselves down again and work with what's being presented in the media. But I guess when, when we see things like that, it's about, and this is going to sound a bit kind of wrong maybe, but it's about choosing our battles. And I don't have a lot of faith in that particular media source to actually print the truth when, when it comes down to it. So, so, you know, we might, I'll let Jackson speak to this, but we behind the scenes might actually have some conversations with some of the professionals that have made comments to try and uh, bring back a much truer picture to the ground, basically, and try and influence things that way. And um, I didn't want to print yours because it wasn't following what they want to do, in other words, you know? That's it. So I was a bit grumpy, Gary, because then three or four weeks later when my comments actually suited what they were trying to put out there, they were used without my consent. So it is that sort of, um, you've, got, you've got to work with the media, but the level of trust and the level of involvement you have is often guided by your conversations with colleagues mm. and what things you want to come together on and have a voice on and how much influence you're going to have. They're not really looking for the truth. They're just looking for... Yeah, and look, Jackson and I have had conversations. Some of those statistics were not accurate. So I guess it's always really important that you actually take statistics with a grain of salt. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I'm just looking at the chat. I I've, I've probably agree in that sense because, it, and look, I think, yeah, I'll let Jackson speak because I'm conscious of time, but that was my reaction and, and we did get asked to comment, but we weren't utilised mm. in the space. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. Gary, I might just hold the questions. We'll keep ourselves on mute because we've only got about 10 minutes. Sorry, mate. Mm. Jackson? Um, I'm, I, I don't really care what they print, to be honest, in the sense that, like, it's, it's all a load of crap. Um, so, like, our focus, I probably, I, I would rarely, and I've never really commented to the media on things, unless it's an article about like, the service or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, purely because I, I, my approach to it is saying to call a spade a spade, I'll reach out to Foundation 61 and have a direct conversation. Uh, that for me holds a lot more impact because I can control the communication that right? the whole issue with this media piece is that they own they own the, the communication, they can print whatever they want and I would rather just not be associated with it at all um, because you, know, you tend to get burned or you just get disregarded. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think your kind of article and what you're writing is rubbish, so I don't really care. Um, if you want to publish a real article, then we can have a conversation. Um, so I think, you know, it's for me, it's about, okay, how can we break down this misinformation and re-educate, re-inform at a meaningful relationship-based local level? So it's about having conversations with people that are, you know, potentially ill-informed to provide the correct information. And, and we're very transparent with the information that we give. Um, but I just don't see... For me personally, being involved in something like that, I find adds kind of fuel to the fire because, you know, clearly there's some strong conviction in these articles and some very strong beliefs. And often they're really kind of set in stone. So, and kind of the only way to challenge that is, I find, kind of face to face in a conversation and, and building a relationship because otherwise it becomes for tat um yeah and jackson i suppose 12 years ago i took made the decision to start doing parent and community education because i felt yeah. i was better having a voice to 100 parents in a session about what was really happening based on what i could bring from josie and malcolm and cass who were working in the sector than sitting there playing ping pong with the addy around around data that sort of senses so i i totally agree 
look, we've got about five minutes. We didn't know how long this was going to take. Um, I'm really stoked that we've started with AOD and we've started with this journey and really want to acknowledge the work that Malcolm and Cass and our student K KJ from the Gordon who, who really pulled all this together have done because you've had an opportunity to have some of the brains who are working in this sector, who've got this firsthand, who are doing this right now. What I want you to do is go back now and read those articles in the Addy again with all of this in mind, in front of mind. I want you to read it with critical literacy about is it coming from a health angle or is it coming from a criminal angle? Who's been interviewed in this? When we see who's been interviewed, who are the people making the comments? That speaks volumes about what they want to get out of an article. And I want you to ask yourself, who's missing in this commentary? Who hasn't been asked? Because there are big, big gaps in this one. Mm -hmm. And be reminded that it's not because they didn't want to comment. As Josie said, more often than not, we'll send a press release about this, but good news stories, it doesn't, it just doesn't work. Yeah. So the questions, Malcolm, we'll, we'll get the questions online this afternoon. There'll be a combination of questions. We know um, we're going to get back together next Thursday. So yeah. you're going to have an opportunity. You will be able to answer the questions whether you choose to do it as an individual or as a group. That's a choice up to you and your RTO. Um, and you can actually, there'll be a portal on that that you can put your questions back through so we can have a chance to read them so we can reframe the next part of this conversation. So that's where you we get to see sense of how you'll perceive this information and how you've weighed it up against what you've read in the Addy. And then we can start to reframe for the next session and we can start giving Josie and um, Jackson a, a really hard time. And and, um... <laughs> and we are here for the four sessions. So you've got us as part of the discussion. So um, we're looking forward to hearing from all of you on screen as to your thoughts and yeah, really having good dialogue. And thanks Lee for today, because it's been a real pleasure to just have a dialogue about it and share mm. our views as people and as professionals. So mm. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Yeah, and I think when, when we came up with this idea, it was very much about the most important thing to people like Jackson, Josie, Malcolm and, and other workers who are here is the next generation of workforce that's coming through. Yeah. That's absolutely critical yeah. for us. So anything we can do to strengthen that and hopefully this will lead us towards that so if you've got feedback about it too um please jackson has done what no person would ever do in this situation he's actually put his mobile number rookie mistake oh, 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 please put that straight into your phone everybody <laughs> Um, I'm not going to do it this session. Maybe next. We'll see how we go. I like, I like dinner first before I can commit to something like a phone number in a group, but that's that's just me. Um, look, I, I will put in the chat the Batforce um, website. Give us, please, till at least the end of the day um, because we needed to hear how this went. If you haven't had a chance to look at the website, it's actually a really cool website. It's got some really cool stuff on it. I'm super proud of the work we did last year on it with the Trellos. Um, we'll have a SCOCHAT landing page, which will have the questions and we'll be able to attach. So Joseph said, you said, yes, so you might have some other papers. We can throw all of those papers onto that page. So you'll have it there. Yep. Um, Cass, have you got anything in closing that you would like to say? And I'm just going to have to excuse myself because I have to go and chair another meeting. So thanks, Joyce. all. See you later. Love your work. Thanks, Joyce. Sure. Um, just for me personally, the um, uptake of this has been incredible from my students and the students of Gordon. So I really appreciate it. Um, we didn't lose a single person through the whole 